can hear you now. Thanks. I see somebody nodding. Uh, perhaps one last question. So do they see all the blackboards from the online? So what happens is uh, we'll be switching between these blackboards here. Yes. If you guys want to take a look at this thing right here. Okay, so okay, okay, but in principle, if I just use these two blackboards, it's better, right? Exactly. Okay, okay, that it should, it should be fine, it should be fine, it should be fine. Okay, just yeah. all right. Hey, ciao. please have a seat. Um, good morning. I'm Nicola Gigli, and uh, yeah, this is the first, the first lecture of um, my course about uh, the Riemannian curvature dimension condition. Um, Information about this course can be found at the web page. Uh, you know, this course is part of the thematic semester on non-smooth geometry, the Riemannian and Lorenzian geometry, uh, which is taking place now in the fields. Uh, all the information about this course, schedule in particular, or anything that may occur will be found on, on that web page. Uh, if you need to contact me, uh, feel free, please feel free to do this anytime. Uh, my, I have an email at Fields Institute that you also can find on this, on this web page, but I'm not sure how long it will last when I will be back in Italy and whatever. If you want, I mean, just as a permanent address, you can use, uh, you can use this one. So I'm from CISA, Italy. Um, yeah, perhaps one of the first small announcement. So next lecture is a schedule uh, next Monday, but next Friday there will be no lecture. Okay, I will be sure to write this down on the website uh, uh, so that uh, even persons that are not here uh, can know about this. But you know, that's that's it. all right. Um, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Despite the announcement being having been given, you know, only late about this online. Well, that's good. All right. Um. Uh. What it is? So, what it is this 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 uh series of lectures about? It is about uh, understanding a bit of uh, uh, what it means for a non-smooth structure to possess uh, a, a bound from below on the Ricci curve. Okay. Uh, so first task is basically understand the definition of, of this space of I mean, the correct definition of this space and this will take at least half of the course I would say and then if you know if really I'm able to stick enough of the course the definition the other half is about properties of the spaces now where this theory comes from well the starting point is the following theorem uh, I mean if you if you been or uh, either online or physically to Turm's talk uh, a couple of days ago, I'm basically going to repeat something that he already mentioned. But anyway, for those of you who are not familiar with the theory, so the starting point of the theory is the following result by uh, Sturm and Voranes. And, but this is a result, I mean, it's very important that I want to acknowledge that this comes uh, after uh, um, related results by Otto Villani. And uh, um, uh, even uh, earlier result uh, uh, that goes, I mean, after, after Cordera scan. Uh, this is one person, Mekan, has uh, a lot of things having to do with displacement interpolation. Uh, I mean, this can be traced back to Mekan. And uh, Smuka Schlager. Uh, sorry, could you please yes. write down a little larger? It's really hard. Yeah, larger. Okay, okay, okay. Good. I will. Small uh, Yeah. Uh, and the theorem tells the following. So let M G. It is large enough. B. Remind me. And I will all, I mean, unless otherwise stated, and I don't think I will ever state otherwise, but for me, a Riemannian manifold is complete, connected, smooth, and without boundary. Okay? So, the, so that's the best uh, Riemannian manifold that we have. Uh, then uh, the following are equivalent. First condition the rich curvature of M is uniformly bounded from below by some real number k, okay? 
I will be, I mean, I will be a bit more precise in a second about what this means. And second, uh, for any couple, mu zero, mu one of prob Borel probability measures on M with, um, um, let me say, bounded support. There exists a, a W2 geodesic. And if you have no idea what this is, it doesn't matter. I mean, it matters, but I mean, we'll take care of this. Uh, W2 geodesic. Uh, that, let me call it mu t, you know, uh, interpolating so from mu zero to mu one. Such that um, the relative entropy is k convex along this geodesic. So the Boltzmann Shannon entropy, let me write it, uh, um, let me write it this way. And well, uh, this is less or equal than one minus t and well, mu zero, but t times m volume u1 and then there is a minus k over 2 t1 minus t w2 squared u0 mu1 okay so this is the statement right now let's pause for a second and let's try to understand what this is now the Ricci so first of all Ricci curvature what is the Ricci curvature okay if you Okay, it's a real number. Yes. If you want, let's let's say let's so let's M be Zimanian and the K real number. Then the following two are equivalent. Of course, this is the same K appearing in item one and that. Um, now, uh, if you know what the Riemann tensor is, uh, then uh, you can define the Ricci tensor. So the Ricci tensor is is something, is a tensor. So you have a Riemannian manifold uh, at every point, uh, it picks uh, two tangent vectors and returns a real number. Okay. And it is defined in the following way it is just uh, uh, the sum from uh, one to n, and is the dimension of the manifold of the Riemann tensor of V EI W EI, where at any point uh, the EIs form an orthonormal basis of the tangent space at that point. Okay. Uh, because of the symmetry, now if you know what the Riemann tensor is, uh, perhaps you know that uh, uh, the Riemann tensor is unchanged if you swap the first two entries with the last two entries. And therefore, for, out, out of this symmetry, it follows that the Ricci curvature is a symmetric. All right. All right. Now, if you have a symmetric uh, tensor, uh, it makes sense. I mean, on, on the space of symmetric tensor, there is a natural ordering, you know, the partial ordering of symmetric tensor. And, and speaking about the Ricci curvature of M greater or equal than K means, I mean, I will write this to mean that uh, for every you know, vector field, uh, for every vector field B, uh, vector field, I don't know how to mention it, vector field on M, we have that on M, we have that the Ricci curvature calculated in the direction of BV is greater or equal than k times g of vv huh? the the metric of course is our first symmetric tensor that we have uh, uh on m on our manifold okay and uh now this so so it's that this is I, sh I should write in this way to be to be more more precise but i will often omit this g from from, from the right okay so that makes sense now, if you don't know what the Riemann tensor is, and uh, and therefore what 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 this is about, don't worry. The, the important thing that you should know is that the Ricci tensor is a symmetric two tensor. So that that's okay, and it has to do with the geometry of the underlying manifold. And uh, and we are going to learn about how bounds on this tensor affects the geometry and the analysis on a manifold in the course of this series of lectures. Okay, very good. So item one is you know. Okay. Now let's speak about item two. So what is this guy? So the relative entropy functional. And for the moment, I will stick to you know in, in this way. 
So I, I will think of it as a functional from the space for the moment. Let me take from the space of uh, probability measures, Borel probability measures on M. Let me put a subscript here. We bound that support. You will be clear in a second why something of this for of this form is needed to uh, the real numbers. Possibly the value plus infinity is allowed. Okay. And this is defined in the following way. So this takes a probability measure with bounded support and retards uh, a real number or, or plus infinity. And, and how is this defined? I mean, you know, this is the Shannon Boltzmann entropy. So this is equal to, there are two cases. Either mu is absolutely continuous with respect to the volume measure, or it is not. Perhaps it has a singular part. Now, if it has a singular part, you define the entropy to be plus infinity. Easy. If it is absolutely continuous, then it has a density, a rather than density. Say that mu is equal, let's say, to rho times vol. Well, rho is now is a, an integrable function with you know inter, non negative with integral one. And then in this case, the entropy is the integral of rho log rho. D1. Okay. Notice that with respect to the convention common in physics, there is no minus sign over here. So a direct mass, so the thing with from the physical perspective as the least entropy because it's very concentrated. In this convention, it has entropy maximal entropy. Okay. I guess it's for just for historical, uh, there is no excuse, it's just for historical reason. Uh, how things have been uh, came out in this way. Okay. Uh, now, one comment. In order to give this definition, I should be sure that this guy here is integrable. All right. Uh, now it is because I'm sure that it's integrable because I assume the measure mu to have bounded support. Right. So this integral, this integral, this integral that in principle is an integral over the whole manifold, in fact, is an integral. Over just uh, the support of the of the manifold of, of the measure, and uh, and this so because you know the function z log z has both positive and negative parts, right? But the, the contribution of the negative part is for sure finite because I'm integrating over over um, uh, you know a set of finite uh, of finite mass. Okay, it's bound. I guess z log z is bounded from below by minus one over e or something of this form. So it's uniformly bounded from below. So the so here. A, a something of the form plus infinity minus infinity does not apply. Okay, so be cautious when, for instance, you want to compute the entropy even on the on RD or even on R. It's not that any probability measure has an entropy because, in principle, you can have a troubles, uh, you know, uh, of, of this form. So uh, just a little bit of, of care. Okay, all right. I can relax. In fact, uh, in, uh, soon uh, we will relax uh, this bound. So basically, what you don't want. Uh, uh, is that is that the the contribution of the negative part is uh, is is plus infinity I mean or minus infinity according so you don't want uh, the mass to be too much spread out with respect to how much uh, is spread out the mass of the reference okay but for the moment I mean we will take care of this but for the moment this is you know perfectly viable okay so now I've defined the end. Okay? now it only remains to define uh, what it is this w two geodesic. Which I will not actually do now. Uh, it takes time. I will do, um, but uh, um, I want to at least uh, list a few of the properties of this W two geodesic. So first of all, this interpolation that is known as displacement interpolation or Wasserstein interpolation or, or optimal transport interpolation, it has nothing to do. It has nothing to do with the classical affine interpolation. Okay. So, 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 and I, okay, I have to say, I'm a bit emotional in saying this in front of Robert McCann. I mean, this displacement interpolation is basically the first thing uh, that I've learned about, you know, real research world when I was an undergraduate. This crazy thing about uh, 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 interpolating measures in an no, absolutely nonlinear way. And looking back at how much, you know, history has been created upon, upon this is uh, quite amazing. Um, so it is not, so it is not, sorry, uh, end of the personal parenthesis. Let's go back to one. Uh, so this is not uh, uh, one minus t. Huh? There's nothing to do with this. Okay, absolutely nothing to do. Um, perhaps uh, a, 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 a first intuition about what this is is if you think in the particular case 
where mu zero is a delta at some point and mu one is a delta uh, on a different point, then mu t, a choice at least, a choice of mu t would be uh, put mu t, the delta at some gamma t with gamma geodesic from x to y. Okay, so you have two points, a direct mass, a direct mass over there. You look, you know, the geometry of your underlying space, you have a Riemannian manifold, so you have a geodesic. By the way, for me, geodesic is always globally minimizing geodesic, okay? Not, not uh, the more common uh, use on, on uh, you know, Riemannian context of locally minimizing. In metric geometry, geodesics are basically only globally minimizing, okay? Uh, and then you just basically follow the geodesic and you put a delta, you know, time t, okay? More generally, I, 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 you know, I don't want to be precise now, but more generally, if mu zero has a certain distribution of mass, mu one another distribution of mass, what optimal transport does is basically to, you know, almost, almost, I mean, under, I mean, in this case, I guess under fairly general conditions, Robert uh, uh, proved that what happens is a kind of a generalization of this construction. So to mu zero, almost every point, it is associated a target point uh, uh, um, in a such a way that the law of the map coincides with the you know, distribution of the target measure. And then the, the optimal, the geodesic interpolation will be you know, basically following each of these geodesics at the same time. Okay. Um, now, from a, you know, from a more rigorous perspective, what you should know, I mean, that should be sufficient for today and actual definitions and theorems will come later on. But what, what you should know is that, and this is all more generally, if say X D is a, okay, let me, let me, let me, let me perhaps exaggerate with the uh, complete, I mean, sorry, complete and separable, let me say. You don't really need any of this, but uh, separable, but let me, I will stick to this assumption, metric space. Questions? Ah, I didn't say, but I mean, feel free to ask questions and interrupt uh, at any point. Yes, please. Uh, well, I mean, to define the distance, you don't need other computers, no separate. Yeah, but I mean, you still yeah, I mean, you typically you can replace, I mean, you just want the support of the measures to be separable. I mean, and that's, and that's, and that's, so, so, uh, but I mean, yes, 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 I mean, this really nitpicking, uh, you know, and polishing or generalizing the theory. I mean, Everything will happen in the competence about us. Um, uh, then, um, um, well, there exists. Okay, I mean that's a big claim, but you know, the, the, one can define. Then one can define, you know, a distance on on the space. Okay, let me let me first say something which is not really true. Of Borel probability measures, okay, and this distance I will call it uh, W two, um, and um, uh, so a bit of history. W comes from Bastestein, that actually has nothing to do with the introduction of this uh, distance. Um, in fact, this distance should be called uh, uh, Kantorovich or Kantorovich Rubinstein kind of distance. Luckily, in, the, in his first work on optimal transport, Kantorovich used the word the W to mention the work needed to make uh, transport from one mass to the other. So let's pretend that this is work. So we respect, uh, you know, um, Kantorovich, uh, Kantorovich original uh, paper of tremendous impact on, on the field. Um, uh, so distance W two and 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 this distance and this distance is the following property. So well, actually, let me let me let me put this here. So I should be more precise. Um, uh, what is P2 of X? P2 of X, this is the space of Borel probability measures uh, with finite second moment. So such that the integral of distance squared mu is finite hmm? for some, so the finiteness of this integral is independent from the chosen point X bar, okay? Uh, the value, of course, depends on the point, but the, the fact that this is finite does not. So 
So this set is a well-defined subset of, of, of border probability measures and certainly contains all the measures with bounded support. Because if the support is bounded, if nothing happens outside a certain bounded set, this integral is finite and can be bounded by you know, the radius, the diameter of the support. And, uh, and, uh, and, and what turns out is that the space uh, P2XW2 uh, is, is, first of all, is complete and separable, much like the space X. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Yes. So since X is complete and separable, P2 um, uh, of X is also complete and separable. Thanks for uh, clarifying this. And second, uh, has geodesics, well, is, is a geodesic space if X is so. All right. Uh, so if you follow the lectures by, by uh, Alexandre Licia, Coranton, Petrunin, you should have an idea of what. Uh, geodesics uh, on a metric space are in for if you if that's not clear to you let's just pretend that there's curves of shortest length okay i will be of course i will you know prove all of this for, for the moment i'm satisfied with the heuristic description um and what is that i want to say and uh, and by the way by the way uh uh the original space xt always isometrically embeds in here so the map x uh, to delta over x. Uh, can you read online if I write over here? I hope so. OK. Uh, is an OK, thanks. Is an isomer. Meaning that the distance, the w2 distance between delta x and delta y is always equal to the distance between the base points x and y. Okay, you can take this as a you know first little but significant information about the fact that this w two distance is related to the geometry of the underlying space. At least, you know? notice that for instance, if you pick if you put here uh, total variation distance or Prokhorov of distance uh, or other distance typically not originated from optimal transport, you will not get this equal. Okay, so a little bit of you know the geometric significance of the optimal transport theory. Uh, into metric geometry is, you know, at least intuitively due to this kind, this kind of uh, basic information. Okay. Um, now, if you accept this as sort of a truth, okay, uh, uh, as I encourage you to do for the moment, then at least you know the statement makes sense, right? Because so now, now a Riemannian manifold, of course, is a metric space when you induce the, you know, the. the the classical distance by minimizing the action of curves. This is a geodesic space, so so it makes sense. So, so there are geodesics, W2 geodesics between, between uh, measures. In fact, in most cases of interest, it is unique, thanks to McCann's result, but for the moment, I don't really matter for, about this. And, 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 and this makes sense. Okay, sorry, I forgot here to say that this should be true for every t. Okay, maybe it was clear for every t between zero and one. Okay, now I will take I will take a little bit of time. Um, uh, I mean, a, a few lectures uh, will be needed in order to properly introduce, with all the details, the this w two distance. Uh, for the moment, I'm satisfied. Uh, I'm satisfied with this informal description, and I want to look at the structure of this theorem. And I want you to compare this theorem to the following uh, well-known result. Uh, let me read this. Let F from RD into R be smooth. Then the following are equivalent. First, the Hessian of S, the Hessian of F. Is bounded from below uniformly and say and k the number 
uh, it's bounded from below by k, or I should say k times the identity. The Hessian is a symmetric tensor. It makes sense whether this is. And two, for every x and y in Rd, we have the convexity inequality. That is to say, f, well, let me write it, f at the t intermediate point between x and y. So that should be one minus t x plus t y. This should be uh, less or equal than one minus t f plus t, uh, sorry, f of x plus t times f of y minus, I guess, k over two t y minus t. This squared is something next one. Okay. In which sense are these two theorems analog? Well, let's have a look to, to, the, to this, you know, this, this should be more familiar, right? I guess, you know, this everybody knows. Now, why, what, why this is conceptually important, at least for, for what I want to say in this course? Uh, well, the first item one is a differential information. You need to know how to take derivatives and you really need the smoothness assumption in order to be sure that, that you can compute at every point the hash. That's really need. Okay. The second item does not. You don't need any smoothness for that. Okay. And in fact, in fact, say, say imagine k equals zero. So non hash non negative and convex inequality. Once you learn about this identity in high school, typically, soon after, soon after, you define a convex function as a function satisfying this inequality, not as a smooth function for radiation. Okay. And why, you know, why we are taught uh, this way? Well, because this is way more robust. Okay. For, uh, it's also, I mean, it's also more general. It's something that makes sense, you know, in higher generality. You don't need even finite dimensionality or anything of this form of this sort. But for instance, let's, I mean, for the purpose of this course, imagine you have, you, 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 you ponder the following question. You have a sequence, Fn, of, um, um, say, smooth and convex functions. And the sequence converts pointwise to a limit function that for some reason, for some reason, you already know it is smooth. Okay, in general, of course, pointwise convergence of a smooth function is not good, but let's say that you already know in, for whatever reason that the limit function is more. Um, uh, can you deduce that the limit function is also convex? Now, if your only information about convexity is this, of course, you can prove this, but, but this is only trick because typically, second, you know, you have a pointwise conversion that, that is not sufficient to per se to pass to limit in, in a second order in a point. Of course, a posterior it is, but at least it's not trivial. Why, right? if you know about this, when point wise converts, you write the inequality for f and you pass to limit that there's nothing easier than that. Okay. And moreover, moreover, this inequality in some sense captures the, the key information about being convex or, or k convex without the need of relying on, you know. Had an assumption that may be unnatural in, in this context. Why is smooth? I mean, why absolute value shouldn't be a convex function? I mean, I will only satisfy the convex. The convex right? Okay, then with this in mind, let's have a look to this here. Let's observe that item one requires smoothness. You really need a Ricci Fulbright tensor in order to in order to speak about uh, item one. You need to have a metric tensor, take two derivatives, Riemann tensor, trace it, and get the Ricci. There's no way. I mean, other than that, there's no way. Okay. Okay. You can, you know, tweak a little bit the smoothness assumption. Maybe you can do with the C1 metric tensor or C01 or whatever, but you know, you need to take derivatives. While item two, there are no derivatives, no derivatives involved. Okay. All you need, all you need is a measure that you use to compute the relative entropy, a reference measure. And the distance that induces through this abstract machinery that I've not really given you know, too many details about, but for the moment, but you have a distance on the base space, you have a distance on the Barsen space, and therefore you can speak about W2 interpolation. And, and the trend, okay? So this leads, or I should say, this led Lord Sturman Villani proposed the following definition. Let me first give a little bit of setup. Uh, 
for me and for the entirety of this class, symmetric measure space is always, always, without exception, such that uh, um, always such that. So as a metric space, uh, it is complete and separable. And before, and the, the reference measure should be Borel, uh, non-negative, non-zero. I don't want to, you know, trivial uh, trivial spaces. Uh, so strictly positive. Okay. And uh, and I want bounded sets to a finite mass. Okay, so I don't. So Radon is not sufficient. I really want. I really want m of say b to be finite for every b uh, bound. Okay, of course, any Riemannian manifold with induced volume measure and distance satisfies this. It's very basic. And then the definition. This is a lot. This has been given. Let me write. Let me write. Let, let's with any. I mean, uh, there, are, there has been two papers that, in the, one by Lot Villani and the other by Sturm, that came out more or less at the same time, with the, you know, based on the same underlying principle, a little bit of technical differences, but. Uh, you know the, the basic the basic point of, of their ideas uh, uh, is very common. So let me just quickly acknowledge the definition to the three of them. Um, uh, we say so. Let uh, k uh, be a real number. Sorry, not a real number. Okay, we say uh, that a metric measure space as above x d m has uh, a rich curvature greater or equal than k. Let me put quotation marks. If for every mu zero, mu one, Borel probability measures on x with bounded support, so BS stands for bounded support, there exists a, a, a W2 geodesic. Okay, that should say, I should, let me be more precise. We want support and finite entropy. I will comment on this in a second. Uh, there exists a W2 geodesic connecting them uh, such that basically, well, okay, such that, let me write. The relative entropy this time with respect to this reference measure that in my mind is, a, is the volume measure uh, is uh, uh, at the you know t intermediate point is bounded from from above by one minus t the entropy of the reference measure at the starting point plus t times the entropy of the target measure And then the square distance, much like uh, much like in the Riemannian case, for everything. Okay. Um, so a couple of technical. So just, perhaps I, let me just make well, a couple of technical. So first of all, this requirement of finite entropy. Uh, you, I mean, this is really just for technical reasons. But morally, if the entropy of either one of these is not finite, then this inequality does you nothing. So there's really no point of insisting of insisting. It's just to do with the, I mean, it's important to be that is here in the non non compact spaces, but in compact or uh, proper spaces, this is an irrelevant information. Uh, now, this, of course, is in quotation marks. I have not defined the rich denser. Okay, and, and I'm not claiming that there is a rich denser. I'm just saying, in some weak sense, the rich is bound from below by K. In some sense, much like one can interpret this inequality as the Hessian is bounded from below by K, even though a priori I've given no Hessian for that. All right. Uh, what I mean. Okay. Uh, I guess. Uh, Nicholas, uh, sorry. Comment? Please. Yes. Uh, I think you, you want to assume that the metric is geodesic? No, I don't want. Oh, you don't want to assume that? Thanks for this. Thanks for this comment. I don't want. Um, I, I want. The existence of this W2 judicious. Okay. I mean, this is really just, I mean, okay, so let's be honest. So if the space is proper, then this condition implies that the metric is judicious. 
right, right. I okay. don't want to insist on that because a priori there could be crazy infinite dimensional spaces uh, that are not judicial, but such that for any two measures with finite entropy, I still can find the W2 judicial connection there. Okay, well, but, but they at least lens uh, in a metric spaces, right? Yeah, yes, it's always it's always an inner space, yes, a, a length space. So a consequence of this assumption is that is that at least on this, so this, uh, I mean, we're going to uh, um, anticipate some technical uh, condition, but of course, Vitaly knows a lot about metric geometry, so it should be precise. So on the support of this measure, um, and and so any couple of points in support of the measure, maybe there, there is no geodesic, but for sure, as a consequence of this assumption, there is a sequence of curves whose length approaches the distance, uh, the distance between these two points. And in that sense, for M cross M, almost every couple of points, there exists a geodesic. Okay. In some sense, um, but these, uh, I mean, uh, you can forget about all, all of this for the moment. Think that the space is compact and geodesic, and, and that and that you will lose, you will lose uh, nothing about that. Okay. Um, perhaps, uh, perhaps one last uh, one last comment, and then then I, then we take a break. Um, a consequence of the fact that I insisted on this being with finite entropy is that I see nothing of what happens on open sets to which the reference measure m gives no mass okay so so for from the perspective of metric measure geometry what me the measure is part of the data and this is where you know the mass is and you only care about the shape of your space where there is some mass where there is no mass doesn't matter basically so so in some sense in some sense, uh, you know, you know, only the only this, the support of the measure that I didn't define yet, but you know, only the you know uh, closed set to where the measure is concentrated really matter in terms in terms of giving the you know the definition of loss to mobility. Okay, now let's pause for five minutes and we will you know resume in, yeah, in five minutes. And I'm writing other lecture notes. Um, I guess, uh, but but anyway, I forgot. Uh, is, is uh, Robert is 11:40, right? The deadline. The the, the the okay, okay. Uh, five minutes has passed. Has passed. Uh, let's let's come back. Uh, okay, the mic the mic is on. Let's come back to uh, this overview. Um, there is one important thing that you should know. So if you know nothing about Ricci curvature. Beside it being a symmetric tensor, there is, another, there is another thing that you should know that from, please. Um, yes. I will. I will. Not today. Okay. Not, today. Not, today. Not, today. Not, today. Not today. So you have to come to the next lecture if you want to. Um, um, okay, so this material, this material that I'm going to say today and for the first few lectures, uh, you can find it in uh, Cedric Villani book, Cotima Transport All the New. Okay, the book is very big, so you should select appropriate chapters. But I'm telling you know, nothing new with respect to, to what comes comes uh, from, from, from that book. But I will, you know, I will provide more detailed reference uh, later on. Um, uh, so I was saying uh, one, one uh, um, thing that you should know about Ricci Curvature, uh, if you know nothing about it, is well, first of all, it's a symmetric tensor, and second, um, geometric uh, and uh, analytic informations uh, uh, can extract it from a lower Ricci curvature bound most often, I mean, not always, but most often if it is coupled with an upper dimension bound. So what matters? What? Often, not always, but often matters. Uh, in geometric, analytic, um is uh, is the capping of you know of a lower reach lower reach bound and an upper dimension bound dimension bound. Okay, 
So in this statement by Stun Borenes, there is no upper dimension bound. Okay. Uh, but so in some sense, one says, oh, so let me let me give a definition. So for for a k a real number and n real number, not necessarily integer uh, between uh, one and infinity, one says uh, one says that. The Riemannian metric, the Riemannian uh, manifold Mg, um, satisfies the curvature dimensional condition. The okay, the CD Kn condition. Uh, if you know the Ricci curvature is greater than K, uh, and the dimension. Is less or equal than n. Okay. So, in some sense, Sturmborn, you can replace Sturmborn's theorem by saying, look, the entropy is satisfies this inequality if and only if the manifold satisfies a CDK infinity condition. If you, no? if you put in upper bound by plus infinity means no upper bound. Okay. Now, of course, the first thing one typically Thinks about when sees this definition for the first time is uh, why n should be real. I mean, the dimension is integer, so clearly here, uh, I mean, you could always improve a little bit by taking, you know, the least, the, the largest interest integer below n. There are reasons for that. In some sense, from the analytic perspective, uh, uh, there are situations where the dimension or the best upper boundary dimension is not an integer number; it's something else. We will see about this later on. Uh, for the moment, I ask you to believe me. And uh, and um, and what I want to say, another important thing to notice, is that uh, there are variants of uh, Sturm-Vorenes theorem that take into account general curvature dimension conditions. So this is the statement basically for C D K infinity. Uh, believe me, you know there is an analogous statement. Or there are actually a plethora of statements depending on you know, many equivalent versions, uh, but where the basic principle is always the same. So you couple you. So a CDKN condition can be encoded in an integrated form in some sense through some sort of convexity like uh, inequality for a, an entropy like function. Okay, maybe it's not precisely as simple as this inequality, something more elaborate. Maybe it's not the integral of rollo grow, but perhaps the integral of some other function of the density or something like that. But but you know the basic idea is, is, is the same. Okay, I'm not saying that. The finite dimensional variant is a trivial, uh, you know, consequence of the infinite dimensional one, but the basic underlying principle is the same. Okay, so in some sense, uh, this definition is typically you will find it in the literature as a definition of uh, C D K infinity spaces. Actually, let me write this. So these are what are called the C D K infinity spaces. Okay, but you know, once you have uh, a finite dimensional analog of this theorem, and I will discuss, you know, sooner or later, I will discuss what that is. You, you know, by uh, the analogous, uh, uh, you know, argument, and that's what Lost Tuna Villain did. You can introduce this CDKN uh, kind of class of metric measure spaces that, in some sense, they have uh, lower reach and upper dimension bound. Okay, so CD stands down for curvature dimension. So that's, uh, so the first number is the lower bound on the curvature, and the second number is the upper bound on the dimension. Now, from the from the from the uh, from the perspective of application to Riemannian geometry, in some sense, uh, this class of spaces is not uh, uh, really you know suitable, um, and one needs to refine a little bit uh, this class of spaces, and uh, and that and that is where the RCD. So my course is about RCD condition, and this is defined as the class of CD and spaces. With an additional requirement, the infinity I mean, just you know, so you start hearing a little bit of uh, nomenclature in some sense, terminology, Ibertian. This is something that I proposed in the uh, 2012. And, uh, and um, okay, again, there is a story over here. So, so the the path from CD to RCD, which is basically what this course is about. So this course is about first understanding CD and then reaching RCD, and then possibly going back to the Riemannian world and 
learning something new about Riemannian manifold out of this out of out of this curvature uh, condition. Um, so this part. So another another sort of you know uh, sentence that you will hear a lot in my class uh, is about heat flow, and and because because understanding this guy this thing and its relation with this curvature dimensional condition is about very much about the heat flow, a topic on which uh, I worked a lot with uh, uh, first of all Kuvada and Dota and then with Ambrose and Savare. In fact, it has been with Ambrose and Savare that the first sort of refinement of this condition, uh, the, of the CDK and condition appeared, at least in the infinite dimensional case. And um, so, so the plan is for the course, understanding, understanding what this is, understanding what this is, so get this, and then, and then, and then, uh, and then getting back, if time uh, allows, getting back to the Marian work. Okay. One thing that I will not do, and I apologize in advance for this, but one thing that I will not do, I will never actually prove this theory. Okay. And and that's the reason for this, because to prove this theorem, basically, in some sense, you need to work a lot with optimal transport on smooth spaces, which is precisely what I don't want to do. I mean, I want to do with optimal transport in non smooth spaces, and these sort of the technologies are different. But I promise, I promise that even though you will not have a formal proof, you will get. I promise a quite clear idea why that leads the theorem. You wanted to say something over there? Okay. Um, okay. Uh, what else? Please. So I did the same thing in my first class screen, but um, because in order to prove this theorem, you need to either know a lot about smooth manifolds or develop a lot of your theory, right? Exactly. If you don't want to. Exactly, exactly. I want to, you know, exactly, exactly. That's exactly the point. That's exactly the point. And, you know, even calculus with these. Uh, you know, Cantorovich potential, the Rano smooth uh, area formula. You know, there is a, also a little bit of geometric measure theory in the smooth case that I don't really want to. Uh, so I apologize. I understand that this is, uh, you know, a little bit incomplete, but I, you know, ask you to make this leap of faith and believing in uh, Sturm Borenes. Uh, um, uh, there was one other thing I want to say. Okay, so it's proved, right? So we agree that the theorem is true, right? So that's that's the important thing, right? Okay, very well, very well. <laughs> um, very well. So ah, one thing that I wanted to say. So I've mentioned, I have mentioned that. Okay, I raised the the statement about convex functions, but I mentioned that one of the reasons for uh, for uh, for which this you know convex inequality was good was because it allows you to quickly get stability of convexity under weak convergence uh, of, uh, of functions and and there is an analog of, of this uh, of this um, uh, statement for for both cd and rcd conditions so in some sense both conditions are stable under under weak convergence of of metric measure spaces and and i mean and the theory really uh uh, um, I mean, goes back uh, and is at least in this rich curvature case is really, you know, very much related to the names of the jo uh, Gromov on one side and the Georgie on the other. So Gromov is the person that introduced the concept of convergence of metric spaces, at least in the sense uh, that we are going to discuss uh, during this series of lectures. So the convergence in the so-called the measure of Gromov's topology and the Georgie introduced, uh, which is, I mean, this is that sense the best possible convergence or one of the best possible convergence for metric measure structures and uh, and the George introduced the concept of gamma convergence gamma convergence is the best possible convergence for lower semi-continuous functionals and uh, and uh, for reasons related to the fact okay I will be very vague but let me let me just tell you this so so rich curvature is very much related to Laplace and Laplacian has a variational interpretation, a subdifferential of a suite of, you know, the, of the Dirichlet planets. And this variational inter interpretation means that a lot of things that are related to Ricci curvature turns out to be, in a natural sense, lower semi-continuous functionals. And what happens in this business is that one, when you have a convergence of metric measure structures, the relevant lower semi-continuous functionals, either gamma converge or satisfy what is called the gamma limit inequality. So we and this is you know these two things I will introduce a bit here during my course. Okay, please. Yeah, yeah, three plus one. Yeah, yeah. In the chapters, uh, three plus one out. No, that's that's three point one. Actually, so so I think thanks for this comment. So 
So Gromov should be crazy for the idea of, uh, uh, but I, I mean, I wish if anybody in the audience, either here or online, wants to correct me, I'm perfectly fine with it. So Gromov, Grom, the idea of convergence of matrix structures uh, was certainly him. I think it was Fukaya, the, 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 the first one who actually realized that for convergence of, I mean, when Ricci curvature is, uh, is involved, uh, um, and, you know, you, all, you should also, in some sense, take care of the convergence of the measure. And um, and then you know then after Fukaya, Gromo in some sense reimplemented these ideas in, in his framework. But uh, you're like Gromo, I should, yeah. But I mean the, the idea of or looking, you know, so so there is this green book by Gromo, Matrix Structures for Riemannian and Non-Riemannian Spaces. Is I think one of the book with the best possible title ever. So basically, take a Riemannian manifold, forget about the smooth Riemannian manifold as a chart, and look at the matrix structure. So that's that's in some sense, and look at the convergence of, of, of it. That's uh, the key point. I would say that has been improved by Gromov, and then uh, variants have been introduced. Please. Well, 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 but uh, fair enough, fair enough. But in, I mean, if Gromov's book is extremely clear. What is it? Right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, yeah. oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. But if there is no tensor, uh, I mean, uh, metric, I don't know, I don't know. That's maybe, okay, that's maybe everybody has his own, you know, feelings about definitions, but okay, anyway. Um, now, if there are no questions, I would start with actual math, okay? So stop with uh, uh, abstract uh, mambo, mambo jumbo, and let's go. Now, uh, working uh, on non-smooth structures, like an arbitrary metric measure space uh, can potentially lead, or even not potentially, but actually lead uh, to technical sort of subtleties and issues. And uh, and I don't want this to be an obstacle. Okay. So what I want to do in the today, maybe next time, and maybe for a couple of lectures, lay a little bit of ground about you know a few basic facts, at least about measure theory on complete and separable spaces. Uh, so that you know you are not cured when you hear uh, something like tightness uh, or uh, Prokhorov theorem uh, or disintegration theorem or sort of things of this form. I mean, they are, they are, uh, it's nothing too complicated, but it's something that is often scary, especially for students if they've never seen things in this generality. But uh, so uh, so for a while, I will now do measure theory on Polish spaces. What it is a Polish space? A Polish space is a topological space. This topological space. Topological space. Whose topology is induced by a complete and separable distance. In fact, okay, let me say parabolic. In fact, to be honest, I will actually work uh, directly with a complete and separable metric space D, XD. But I want to emphasize this point of view because for a while, all these statements are really topological. Huh? And, when, and when one does uh, measure theory, I mean, when one speaks on poly spaces, it really means that the actual distance is irrelevant. And, and what only matters is that there exists such a distance, but there is no, no preferred one, okay? Uh, very well. Uh, so let me, so a bit of terminology. So let's say uh, P of X, whatever probability measures. You know, you have, you have a topological space. So you have open sets. So you have Borel sigma algebra, the sigma algebra generated by, by the sets. Borel probability measures. Probability. Um, uh, let me say, I don't know, uh, okay, let me start, let me start perhaps starting with the following easy remark. So, so first of all, uh, if mu is a Borel probability measure, then for every, uh, let me say, um, um, let's say B of X, Borel sigma algebra.
And the first observation that I want to make, I, I'm going to improve this soon, but the first observation is that if you have a Borel probability measure, uh, then uh, for every Borel subset, uh, you do have that mu of E is equal to the imp of mu of U among the U's that contain E open. And this is equal to the soup uh, uh, among all the C in containing E closed of mu of C. Okay, this will be, you know, I don't know if today, but either today or, or Monday will be improved by putting here compact, but for the moment, let me put it closed. Why is this the case? Uh, okay, well, should, let me check uh, that the class. So if I want to prove this, it's sufficient to prove that the class of uh, Borel sets E for, for which this is true contains the open sets and form a sigma. If I do that, so by definition of Borel sigma algebra, I'm done. And uh, so why it contains, it contains uh, open sets? Well, if E is open, this is trivially true, right? Uh, on the other end, on the other end, um, on the other end, of course, an open set. You can always write an open set U as the union, okay, over n union over n of C n, where C n is, uh, you know, the set of points in X, ah, or such that the distance between X and the complement of U is uh, uh, this greater or equal than one over n. Huh? You have an open set. And then you take you know, the set of points whose distance from the boundary of U is bigger than one over N. And it is clear that this holds. And, uh, and by monotone, you know, the monotonicity from below uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, measures. So mu of this set is the limit of mu of C. Okay, so, so in particular, it is this. Okay. So open set belong to this class. Uh, this collection of Borel sets is clearly stable by passing to the complement because you know, there is a little bit of symmetry over here. And uh, so it only remains to prove that it is stable under a countable union. And why it is so? Well, let's say that, uh, let's say that you have sets uh, uh, E n uh, belonging to, I mean, for which the identity is true, fix epsilon, and then find, uh, you know, find open sets U n and close the set C n in this way, in such a way that the measure of E n is, um, uh, what is it? Less, uh, is greater or equal than the measure of U n, I guess, minus epsilon over two to the n, and less or equal than the measure of C n plus epsilon over two to the n. Okay. And then the union uh, of this E n, you are going to compare this with on one side uh, the union of the U n, this is open. And it is clear from, from this condition that uh, the measure of u minus e is less than epsilon. And and uh, and as a, of course you can I cannot take as close that the union the countable union of closed set because that that is not closed in, uh, anymore. But I, I will take the union from little n to capital n of this n uh, so that so that I mean this capital n is so big. Uh, that the measure of um, of uh, uh, the, the whole union up to infinity, or let me say like this, the union uh, from n plus one to infinity of the Cn is less than epsilon. Okay, this you can always do by again by monotonicity. As capital N goes to plus infinity, these sets uh, you know go to zero, meaning the the intersection of all this is the um, empty set, right? So for any mu is a finite measure, no negative. So so by monotonicity from above, once you have an upper bound of the measure, you know that for any epsilon you can find n such that this is true. Okay. And once you have done this, this set is closed, and it is easy to check that uh, you know it gives you the correct the correct bound. Okay. So that's the first thing. Uh, second thing I want to mention is that. Is that um, 
so for any so for any new signed measure assigned finite measure whatever measure next uh we we can you know well let me first write the formula and then, then discuss it the total variation of, of mu is the real number this is equal to the supremum of uh, the integral of f b mu among all the f that are continuous and bounded over x and um, with uh, uh, let me say infinity normless trigger than one let's agree on the notation so cbx is the space of functions that are continuous and bounded over x b sorry yes c yes uh, cb and um, of course if x is compact this coincides with the class of just continuous functions but for x possibly non-compact i want to be you know sure to be able to uh, integrate with you and um, so cb is a banach space for trivial reasons under the sup norm okay i uh, will denote the sup norm by you know the infinity subscript which of course is a little bit you know um, i should not do this because there is no measure there is no l infinity you know measure but let's agree that this you know, the sup okay not the essential supremum with respect uh okay now what is the total variation i assume you are familiar with this uh but basically you know that any signed measure can be written in a unique way and i speak about the hand decomposition as difference between two positive measures that are singular namely they are concentrated on these joint subsets okay and the total variation is nothing but you know the the this number is by definition um uh, mu plus of the whole space plus mu minus of the whole space huh? so notice that in the uh, terminology that i'm choosing the negative part is still a positive measure so so the measure is the difference between these two things not the sum so that's why that's why there is a plus over here okay um and and and, and this is a you know a claim for the lemma okay lemma this identity is true all right um, now the inequality this inequality is trivial right why is this trivial because what is the integral of f d mu the integral of f d mu is by the hand decomposition uh, this is equal to the integral of f d mu plus minus the integral of f uh, in the mu minus right um but uh but this is bounded by one because f is bounded by one uh sorry um, not by one this is sorry uh, this is bounded by the mass of of this measure so f is bounded by one in absolute value huh? so this is less or equal if you want of this guy and then you are putting up to the value plus plus this guy right now this is uniformly bounded by one i dig it out and i get mass of mu plus mass of mu minus and i get and i get uh, yes and i get this inequality huh? this left hand side is less or equal than the sum of these two guys all right so let's go let's go to the other inequality so for the other inequality i used uh, this observation that i made over there um uh yes welcome Carl Theodore Sturm sure a lot of interesting stuff <laughs> uh so now now let's prove the other the other inequality so so uh what I want to say is that so I I, I want to prove now that you know the total variation is less or equal than the supremum uh, over there and how do I do this well first of all I decompose mu as mu plus plus mu minus minus mu minus this is mu and then and then i use uh, this remark over here and i can find uh, for a fixed epsilon and then find uh, find two sets let's say a positive set and the negative set uh, these are disjoint and so such that uh, mu plus 
of uh, you know x minus the positive set is smaller than epsilon and mu minus of x minus the negative set uh, is also smaller than epsilon. see these are closed disjoint well, i can find this right because mu plus and mu minus are concentrated on two borel disjoint subsets i apply this uh, relation to these two Borel disjoint subset, and then okay. okay, this was for probability measures, but these are finite measures, it doesn't really matter. Okay. Uh, well, then now that P uh, and N are, are, are closed, let me define the, the function. So, Fn, uh, let me do so. Uh, what do I do? I do one minus N times the distance from P, and I take the positive part when i write over here i mean i mean that i take the max between this number and zero okay so this function for n big is a function that uh, you know it, it is always equal to one on the set p because on the set p the distance is zero of course uh and then and then it decreases past to zero and then it remains zero when you are farther than uh, one over n from p okay and uh, and gn analogously with the set n And then, and then I define Hn just the difference between Fn and G. And uh, here, what matters is that these functions are uniformly bounded, and this function decreases monotonically to the characteristic function of the set P. So, chi of a set is the function that is one on the set and zero outside. Okay. And because of this, and I guess uh, um, dominant convergence, for instance, you know. That the integral of fn d mu plus goes to mu plus of p, right? And uh, and the integral of fn d mu minus goes to zero for the same reason, right? because in both cases it goes to measure of this, you know, integral of chi p with respect to the right? You combine all of this and you deduce that the integral of, of uh, uh, let me go ahead here. And you deduce that um, uh, the integral of Hn d mu, this converges to um, uh, mu plus of p plus mu minus of n. You just write down, uh, you know, these and the analogous for gn. But this is, uh, you know, because, because of the assumption, this is at least uh, the total variation of mu minus twice epsilon, right? What you have lost in the two steps. But of course, each of these hn is continuous and bounded with norm one, because it is the difference of two non-negative functions with values between zero and one. So the difference is still between one and minus one, right? Okay, so that, that has also been proven. All right, uh, now, nobody ever uses total variation convergence. So the space of measures or probability measures, signed measures with the total variation distance is a terrible space. It's not separable. Uh, Innocent, extremely in innocent looking maps. I don't know. Take consider, you know, take the map, the car that takes t and returns delta at t as a probability measure on zero one. This is non measurable if you put, if you put on this space the total variation, the total variation distance. Just because the distance between any two direct masses is either zero if they are the same or two if they are different. So this map is extremely discontinuous. Okay. So discontinuous that it is not even Borel. Okay. And if you believe in the axiom of choice, not even measure. Okay. So, so, so actually, one uses typically different topologies on the space of, of measures. And, uh, 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 let me perhaps, well, actually, let me start defining the topology.
the, so I'm defining a topology. So the weak topology. On okay, I'll define just on probability measures because I'm a little bit lazy, but the same works for uh, finite signed measures. Okay, X is the coarsest topology. Uh, such that um, uh, for every function f which is continuous and bounded over x, the map that takes mu and returns the integral of f d mu is continuous. Right? Clearly, there exists a weakest topology. So, right? notice, of course, this map is well defined because f has finite mass. The function is bounded, so for sure, you know, this integration is well defined. There is no doubt about that, and I can require this to be continuous. And if you want, as a consequence of of this result, you get that the weak topology is weaker than the uh, total variation, the topology induced by the total variation. Meaning that all these functionals are continuous in the total variation distance because, because of this two. Uh, so a first remark. Uh, 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 by the way, so uh, in literature, this is sometimes called narrow topology or vague topology, according to you know a bit a little bit on the literature. I will just stick with two, two, two weak topology. Uh, just for simplicity. Uh, well, a couple of remarks. First of all, why am I using CBX in place of the space of uh, continuous functions with compact support? I mean, that's you know, the question that one can answer, that one can wonder. And the answer is that uh, I'm only assuming that the space is complete and separable. I know nothing about compact sets on these spaces. And in particular, it could be that any compact set is actually empty interior, like, you know, for Banach or Hilbert spaces of, in of infinite dimension. And if that's the case, any function that is continuous uh, with compact support, it must be automatically identically zero. So you don't really get any. Okay. So you really need to enlarge a little bit, a little bit the space, the space of function. Okay. Now there is a little bit of, of, of choice here. So if you stick with finite measures, this is perhaps the best option. If you want to, if you want to deal with measures that are only finite on bounded sets, that perhaps you should impose, you should just work with functions that have also bounded support or, or thing of, of this sort. But, you know, for me, I will be satisfied. No, 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 bounded. No, no, continuous and bounded function. Bounded function, sorry, sorry, no, this is CB. Sorry, okay, maybe, maybe, maybe I should, uh, uh, you know, clarify a bit the terminology. So CB, continuous and bounded. If I want bounded support, you know, I write BS. The bounded support. Okay. I put it. Thanks for Robert. I mean, and please, if anything creates, you know, even a little bit of, of confusion, especially in these first lectures, uh, just feel free to uh, ask. Uh, so, what is the one? Okay. So, so why are we not using com uh, continuous function with compact support? Can you say that again? Because uh, it could be that my metric space uh, is such that any compact uh, uh, subset has empty interior. Imagine L2, okay? Now, if that's the case, any continuous function with compact support has to be identically zero, right? Because, because if F is, you know, continuous, let's say, with compact support, then, sorry, then the set where F, say, is different from zero, this is open because by continuity and in contained in the support of F which is compact. So if by any chance, the only, you know, uh, all, all the compact uh, uh, subset have empty interior, uh, this means that this set must be empty. So the function must be identically zero. Is that clear? Yes, thanks. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, what, what it is that I want to okay, remark. So, these topologies are the weak topologies. Are. Ah, 
how can I prove this? Well, I need to prove uh, um, it is sufficient basically to prove the following fact that if um, the interval of f d mu is equal to the interval of f d mu uh, for every uh, f in c b, then actually mu must be equal to mu. Do you agree? Right? Because because if that's the case, it means that as soon as you have two measures that are different. You can find a continuous function for which these two values are different. That continuous function induces a, a function which is lean, which is continuous on the space of measures. And you know the, you know you, you take a, so like a, the midpoint of the value over here, and that separates. That gives you the pre image of the of the two half lines which separate uh, the two measures. Okay. Um, so and why is this true? Well, because basically, with the same argument that we have been used, uh, I, I claim that if this is true, then this implies that, uh, first of all, that the measure of any open set uh, so, mu of uh, mu huh? Why? Well, because the characteristic function of any open set can be written as supremum of uh, of uh, uh, continuous and bounded function so notice that chi of u is equal to the soup over n of okay what i should pick um i should pick uh, uh i mean uh, let me think um should be one over there okay i should pick n times the distance between uh, you know point and the complement um uh, and truncate it at one Huh? So, so if if you if so, if this is the mean, no? the mean between this number and one. So, for any n, this function is continuous. I'm just truncating a continuous function at level one, so this continues. For and it clearly it, and it clearly converges monotonically to the characteristic function of u. I mean, if you are outside u, this is identically zero. So that doesn't matter if you multiply by n stays zero. As soon as you are inside u, this is strictly positive because u is open, and and therefore and therefore you know. You, you reach one okay but but now now you write so you write this identity for this function you pass to the limit monotone convergence uh, theorem or dominant convergence they, they both work and you deduce it but once you have the two borel probability measures coincide on open sets you automatically have that they coincide that they coincide uh, on the whole borel sigma algebra that's a consequence of the uh, the inking pi lambda here, right? So the class, now the class of sub Borel subsets for which this is true is closed under relative complement, countable uh, uh, disjoint union, contains the open set, and therefore coincides with the Borel. Okay, general, general uh, um, measure theorem. All right, so, so this is all. Um, perhaps I want to conclude, if I'm able to, I want to prove that this topology is induced by a distance. Now it would be easy to uh, uh, to prove so if the space if x is compact, um, because perhaps uh, I will I will leave a lot of exercise during during this uh, during my uh, lectures. Um, I think, especially in a, speaking to the youngest, it is important that you try to do the exercise. Not that you stop. You may not stop, but at least you should try. Okay. Um, and uh, either if you succeed or if you fail, feel free to contact me either during the lectures or outside the lectures to you know speak about. Uh, what so the exercise is that um, the space CBX is the separable um, if and only if X is complex. Okay. Um, well, let me give uh, another, another couple of exercises. So this is, uh, I mean, this is mildly difficult. This is the next is easy. So the space, the collection of uh, direct masses this, of course, is a, is a subset of the space of probability measures. This is weakly closed. And uh, if you're up uh, to a little bit of a challenge, here's an exercise. This is tricky. 
and uh, it tells you the following. So fix a, a Borel probability measure and consider the collection of measures, probability measures again, that are absolutely continuous with respect to mu. Uh, mu is absolutely continuous with respect to mu. This again is a subset of probability measures. And the, the exercise asks you to prove that this is weakly Borel. That is to say, you know, it is, uh, belongs to the Borel sigma algebra generated by weakly open uh, sets. Um, oh, uh, let me erase this definition. Um, now, if I were in a case where CB was separable, that according to the exercise above is true if and only if X is compact, then, uh, then it would be easy to, to find a distance inducing the weak topology. You basically just pick a countable then subset of the space of bounded continuous. Please. Uh, sup norm. Thank you. Sup norm. Thank you. Uh, let me, let me I'm, I'm, I'm not teaching. <laughs> sup norm. The infinite, you know, uh, with the Banach norm. Um, what was I saying? Okay. So, yes, if CB is separable, then, you know, as much like you do when you prove that the dual of a Banach space, uh, the unit ball of the dual of a Banach space is metrizable as soon as the original Banach space is separable. Okay. By the same sort of principle, if CB was always separable, that would be quite easy to prove that uh, the space of measures is also um, uh, you know, metrizable with the weak topology, the probability measures. Uh, in general, uh, we this is not the case, but thankfully there is you know uh, CB is separable in some sense in the following uh, weaker sense, um, and and this is quite useful. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, I will not write, see, XD is always complete and separable. My metric space is always like that. Uh, there exists a collection D inside CD, countable, uh, such that the following is true. Uh, for any continuous and bounded function, we have that F, is equal to the soup among all the function g in d, g less or equal than f of g, pointwise, huh? and is also equal to the inf uh, or among all the functions h in d, h greater or equal than f of h. So in the pointwise sense, there is a countable collection, and here the, the key is countable. Okay, such that any function continuous and bounded. You know, can be reached from above at any point by 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 uh, functions in this countable collection, right? So let me do this. Uh, um, and the proof goes as follows. Uh, Uh, I tell you uh, first of all, who is all, I mean, a brother of this, a D prime. And pick a D prime, the set of functions of the following form. So, first of all, I fix uh, a sequence uh, uh, dense in X. X is separable, so I have a countable collection of, of dense guys. And then I do the following I pick functions of the form uh, distance function from one of these guys multiplied by a rational number. Plus another national number, and then I take you know max I mean uh, rational and max another rational. So here for you know n is in n, and a, b, c, and d are rational. This is a countable collection, and I claim that uh, for any f in c b x, and for any point we have that f of x is equal to the soup among all, let's say, g prime in d prime, g prime less. Um, OK, um, OK, let me say, OK. Let, um, I have to correct the statement. I have to say something something stronger than that. Uh, and this is equal to the, inf of course, I mean, uh, h 
So I mean d prime h premise of, of h. I mean, this is there exactly the same statement. So actually, here I can do something something stronger. I can do something better. I can say that. Um, let me make a, a stronger statement. Um, so f is the is uh, um, uh, the limit in n of g n, and it's also equal to the soup in n of g n for some, uh, you know, increasing. Increase in sequence g n inside d, and also f is also equal to the limit in n of h n and equal also to the inf. I apologize for this uh, in n for this mistake of h n for some you know decreasing or non. I mean increasing and decreasing is always in the weak sense, so not increasing. The increasing sequence uh, HN. Okay. Here uh, the limit means the point wise limit, right? Say it again? Or the you are taking point wise limit of the function. Point wise, point wise, point wise. Thanks for asking. And same here, right? And the yeah. hypothesis you are assuming for X is uh, just complete and separable. Just like Say it again, sorry. X is complete and separable. That's it. Right? That the metric space is always complete and separable. I will not okay. write it every time just because. Okay, okay. okay. There's no other reason. Okay. No, it does not. I mean, okay. Yeah, choose either. Okay, let's say d d less than c. If you want. So I mean, but what are these functions? So let me let me I mean let me quickly conclude the proof of this factor, and then uh, we postpone uh, the uh, the fact that the weak topology is induced by distance to the next lecture. So these functions are, are a function basically of the following form: you pick a point in this uh, set x n, you look at distance from this point, and you multiply it by a number that you should think as very big. And uh, let's say if the number is positive, the distance function looks at this. And then you perhaps add some constant. So this is not really zero, it's a distance plus something. And then you truncate above at some level. You also truncate below, but this doesn't really matter because you have, you have you know, let me say you're truncating at, at a low level. Okay. Now, what I'm saying is that with functions of this form, okay, it could matter truncating from below, but it won't basically. So what I'm saying is that for any function which is bounded and continuous, and for any point, you can find the sequence of functions of this form. Such that uh, you are, you know, you pick a point x, and basically you can reach the value of this this point x by taking, you know, the, the limit of, of of functions of rational. Yes, it can also it can also be yes in, uh, upside down, and in this case you are looking uh, for the soup kind of thing you you're looking. For. Okay. Now, in fact, in fact, it's, it's trivial to check that with functions of this form. I mean, if you look a little bit at the picture, you stare. The picture for one minute it will confess you everything you want to know. So 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 think about that and you and you and you you know you can prove this result. Okay. But once you have this, the conclusion follows easily because you just define so this collection d prime is countable, no, because you have a countable collection of points and then the coefficients are rational. And then you just consider uh And, and then you consider D basically the collection of, uh, you know, finite, uh, I guess, so the G's are, uh, what, what, so G1 veg, veg GK uh, with GK's, uh, GI's in D prime, and also union, you know, the mean of H1 veg prime, H, H prime K, like that. H i is in D prime, and of course K is an arbitrary uh, national natural number. Does it make sense? So you pick no, you have uh, you have these functions, and you start taking say the mean of a finite number of those, and the and this and the max of a finite number also of those, 
that you should imagine with the opt i mean with the you know the other direction and then and then you know it is clear now being this true this is this is equal to the soup of a countable collection the functions in d prime are countable so those that are less than f are also countable and now you have the soup this soup is actually also equal to the limit of the increasing sequence made by the first function the max of the first two the max of the first three etc 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 and then you are producing an increasing sequence or at least not decreasing sequence that is pointwise converging to f okay and similarly for, for the upper bound right okay so uh my time is over so for today for today that's all um i will continue on monday for the for the next uh, lecture monday it's 10 10 please there is a question D prime. This is D prime. At the moment, I have so at this level, I have not yet defined D. I'm just defined, you know, another set which is D prime, which is which is which is this, and I'm claiming that this is true. And the proof I didn't really give you the proof. I just draw the picture, but I hope this is you know convincing enough um, using the continuity of F. Uh, that's 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 you can. There was there was another question maybe no. Ah, okay, 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 glad. Um, I have no idea what that means, but I'm sure uh, <laughs> I, I will get. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Oh, about lectures, uh, about when, uh, okay, okay. Email address or, or whatever. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, personally, you know, if you. If you want to write me for this, you can, and I will. But you know, lectures I will be listed online, so you can do by yourself. But uh, I guess I think that the decision is important uh, if you are a student of the University of Toronto that wants to give the exam and get, the, of course, the credits for that. But I mean, this matters will sure be said. Uh, okay, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>